Okay, so ye, whenever you're ready. Looks like he's frozen. Uh, yeah, let's let's just wait a second or two, or as or as long as it takes. Um, hang on, let's let's also try contacting in the chat. Okay, did you just sign off? No, you still there. Hello. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, we can. Okay. I seem to have lost the, the connection for a bit. Okay, so you're you're back now. So whenever whenever you're ready to start. Okay. Um, okay, let me start. And if you cannot hear me, just let me know and I'll try to turn off the video or something. Okay, so for today, um, I will talk uh, a little bit about how to deal with uncertainties in patient analysis. So as Ron already mentioned, uh, for this part, uh, please, uh, ask questions were discussed in the base uncertainty channel. So um, in the past few days, I think we have heard a lot about the, the details of how the spatial analysis works. And I think it will be beneficial for us to look at the big picture again, to remind ourselves uh, where, how different pieces fit together because it's, it's easy to, to get lost a little bit in the details when you first, uh, the first time you learn about all these things. Okay, so uh, let me start with the, the 2,000 feet view, so to speak. Okay, I think I think we've lost ye again. Let's let's just hang on. Hello, I'm back. And I'll turn off the video this time. Okay, now you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, great. So let me continue. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, so let me start from the far farthest away view. What we're trying to do is we have some model and then we have some data and we feed them into some analysis machinery and then we get the results. Okay, so obviously this is not too useful if you really actually want to do analysis. So let's zoom in a little bit. So first thing that, that shows up is that, first of all, we don't compare model to data directly. We compare calculations to data, the calculation made from the models. And we don't get output directly from analysis machinery. What we get is an object called the posterior function, which encodes all the information we want to learn about the parameters. Okay. So it's still not too useful to do analysis. So let's zoom in again. And on the calculation side, we see that the uh, it's quite CPU intensive uh, to do the model calculation in general in heavy collisions. Therefore, uh, we try to bypass this, this issue by interpolation. So we do some calculation of some a parameter point, and then we interpolate to get the whole picture. And on the other side, to get the Bayesian posterior, what we need is we need to invoke Bayes theorem, which means that we need the prior, and we also need the Bayesian likelihood, which is kind of compatibility between data and calculation. Okay, 
So let's zoom in even more. And a lot of details start to show up. For example, to go from model to calculation, uh, there's the JSK framework that you can use for this, which uh, we talked about in the first half of the school. Uh, to do the interpolation, we also need to choose the points we first do a calculation from, from and that's what we call the design point. And there it rises the question how to interpolate. Well, the, the method we choose is the Gaussian process emulator. And then how should we deal with the uncertainty? On the data side, uh, we also need to decide what data to compare with, uh, what's the central value, what's the uncertainty, what's the correlation on the data. And in the Bayesian part, there are also a few choices we made. So we can keep zooming in with more and more details, but let's stop here for, uh, for a moment and to think about what's the, really the core of the analysis. So what we are really trying to do is to get uh, the posterior function. And if we can somehow get the posterior function, then we're done more or less. We can just if, uh, an analyze the function and get out the, the thing we want. And to get the posterior function, we need to invoke the base theorem, which uh, contains a prior and a compatibility. And also there's a Bayesian evidence part piece here that I'm not talking about here. And everything kind of follows from here. In order to get, to get a part of compatibility, we encounter some problem, which requires the details that uh, the previous lectures are talking about. But it's important to keep in mind that all we, what we're trying to do is to have some robust way to ca calculate this posterior function. And um, it's, I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, the, the methods that we introduced in the previous few days are not the only methods. So if you have some other way, uh, some other robust way that you can get the posterior function, then those are values as well. And they can be sub substituted in, for example, uh, to do the interpolation, the Gaussian process emulator is not the only way, right? Uh, if you have some other way of that is suitable for your problem, you can substitute that part. Or if your model calculation is very simple, that you are able to write down the analytic form for it, then we don't need really need all these uh, all, all these pieces about interpolation and design points. We can go directly from calculation to to compare with data and so on and so forth. So, um, so well, uh, even though I have said that, but the, the thing that we presented in the past few days are one set of uh, good ways for a robust uh, analysis workflow to get the posterior function. And uh, if, if you are not sure about uh, what, whether uh, you have some other thing, ways to, to get things, then what presented in the past few days are a very great way to start. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's go back to the, to the view again. So the, uh, in the past few days, we have uh, go over a lot of in, in very great details about all these pieces. So I will not go through them again. Uh, you can watch the, the recordings of previous sessions to learn about all of them. And instead, what I will talk about mostly is focusing on one aspect of, of this whole thing, which is the uncertainty. So you see there's the uncertainty and correlations from the data side, and there's also uncertainty from the interpolation. And there's also uncertainty when you quote the final results and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, so maybe let me pause for a little bit to see if there's any questions so far. I don't see any hands and also nothing on the Slack channel. So let's move on. 
Okay, so in order to understand the uncertainty, uh, first, uh, let's take a small detour and talk about the likelihood function in general. This is uh, nothing to do with the Bayesian formulation. And the reason that this is important is because you need to deal with the input from the experiment and they are not all Bayesian analysis. So we also need to understand what's going on here. So the likelihood function uh, is a function that encodes how likely a set of parameters is true, given that we observe the data. So the notation that I'm going to use is this uh, L, standing for likelihood, as a function of theta, which is the parameters of interest, the uh, theory parameters, and conditioning on what we see in data, which is the X here. Okay, so as an example, we can look into the counting experiments. So suppose we're doing some counting experiments and we observe a count of three. Uh, in this case, X is three. And the likelihood function might look like this. And uh, we can see the start to describe what's happening with the function. For example, the mo mo most likely true uh, count for theta is three. This is a peak. And a count of 5.5 .5 is about half as likely. And a count of 8.5 is about 10% as likely if we read uh, from this likelihood function. Okay, so to continue with the counting experiment example. So if we see that the expected count uh, is theta, uh, then uh, we can write a probability of observing a count of X as this. So it's just uh, no, the, the Poisson distribution that we are in, interested in. And uh, this P is the probability to observe any given X. Uh, so it's uh, essentially a function of x of what we can see observing data given a fixed prime, uh, theory input data. And the likelihood function in this case can be written as this. So it's the exact same form. However, uh, there's a, a big difference between the likelihood function and the probability density function on top, which is that the likelihood function is a function of theta given what what we observe in data. So they, they are very different objects, even though they look similar when you write out the, the analytic form. So on the top is a function of what we see. So it's a discrete function. So X is defined at integer values. In the bottom, it's defined continuously uh, for any theta. Okay, so give a little bit more examples of for the likelihood function versus probability density function. So uh, each row is one example. So on the left column is the what we can, can consider as the theory parameter. And on the right hand side is the what we consider, consider as the data. So for example, we can, can have the probability of head per, per flip of coin. That's the theory parameter. And the observed data could be a sequence of heads and tails if you throw it a few times. And we can also have the, for example, the cross section on the left and what we observe in experiment on the right. And one more example, which is a little bit more closer to what we do in heavy collisions. For example, we can have the energy loss parameters for protons as a theory, theory parameter and observed data could be hadron RA, for example. Okay, and if you're writing a, a function of the left-hand side, given what we see in the right-hand side, then that's uh, li the likelihood function. And if you write, given a fixed left-hand side as a function of right-hand side, then that's a prob probability density function. So there, there are different things. <laughs> okay. And uh, since we're talking about Bayesian uh, formulation, there is a, a relative of the likelihood function, which is the Bayesian posterior function. So both of them are a function of the theory parameter given the observed data. 
and they, they both give information of how likely some parameters are given some observed data. So that's the, the common place uh, from it. So in a sense, well, the information we want to get out of it, it's similar. However, there is a very, uh, they, they have a lot of differences as well. And one of the differences that I would like to highlight is that the posterior function in the Bayesian formalism, everything is a probability density function. So there is a probabilistic interpretation of the posterior function. Well, on the other hand, for likelihood function, in general, it's not a probability density function. So what I mean for this is that for the posterior function, uh, talking about areas in the under the curve makes sense. While in the likelihood function, it's less so, for example. Okay, so let's move a little bit closer to the uncertainty that we want to talk about. So once uh, we have either the likelihood or the posterior function, then what we can do is that we can describe the function. So for example, there, there's a likelihood function here and we can describe a different aspect of it. For example, um, well, we can ask, for example, what's the most probable point uh, of this function is, what's the mean of this function, what's the RMS, well, if it's skewed or not, and so on and so forth. And each of these numbers quantify some aspect uh, of this distribution. And here comes the, the important part. So the uncertainty is also a description of the, of the underlying function. And uh, if you don't remember anything else, this is the, the thing I, I would like to, you to remember because this is quite important, even though we don't talk too much about this. So uh, in experimental physics, at least, everything, uh, like every statement, every number we say, always has an underlying distribution. And the numbers or statement that we quote are the descriptions that characterize the function. So for example, the uncertainty, it's some number that characterize how wide the, the distribution is. Okay, so as an example, if we say that we measure something as 25 plus minus five, then what we're actually doing is we are describing the underlying function. So for example, this five, it could mean that the 68.3% uh, most likely interval is 20 to 30. That's one percent potential meaning of this plus minus five. Or it could also mean that uh, this range, 20 to 30, has a likelihood value above one over square root of E of the peak value. That's also a possibility of what this plus minus five means. Or it could also mean that the RMS distribution is five and so on and so forth. So there are many different prescriptions uh, that people use uh, to, to quote this uncertainty number. So let me start with, uh, give some examples. So if, for example, if the prescription of to quote a number, uh, a range is that we quote the range of parameters with likelihood greater than one over square root of E times the, the maximum value. So under this prescription, then if we observe one data point, then the, the range we quote will be 0.3 to 2.35. And if it's 20, then this is the range we quote. And if we increase the X by a lot, then we see that it's converging to the square root and that's we are so familiar with. And this prescription is important because there are a lot of uh, experimental results that's using this prescription. So for example, the, uh, like the Higgs coupling results, that's the, the range they quote is using this prescri prescription. Or for example, the, the latest B sub C result uh, yield is also using this prescription. And for x equals zero, I'll leave it to, to you as a homework to work out what the range is. Another possible prescription to quote a range for the uncertainty is 
uh, for example, if we take the probabilistic interpretation and quote the 68.3% most likely parameters. So it means that this range, the area is 68.3% and it's also the, the most likely parameters that does so. So this is a little more closer to what we are doing with the, the Bayesian analysis because it's, it's a probability density function for the posterior. And this is one of the ways that we can consider quoting the uncertainty. So if under this prescription, then if X equals one, then we will quote 0.27 to 0.5 and so on and so forth. And again, if we say, see that when the X is large, it's uh, converging again to the usual square root of n uh, results. Uh, so again, I will leave it to you to work out what x equals zero should be under this prescription. So the big take, take home message here is that uh, there are different ways to quote uncertainties and the, the, the apparent number that you see might be different depending on how we quote the uncertainty. And there's no universal way of quoting uncertainty among all the experimental results, unfortunately. Okay, so now let's try to go beyond the uncertainty number. So the uncertainty is basically just one number that characterize the width of the core of the distribution. So in other words, it tells us how wide this is at the core level. It doesn't tell us much about this uh, far in tails. <clears throat> and often we need to go beyond a single uncertainty number. So as a mock-up example, suppose somebody measured some quantity, which is one plus minus 0.25. And now the question is, is this compatible with zero? Uh, so let me take a poll here. Uh, please uh, press yes or no uh, in, in your Zoom response to indicate what you think about this. Okay, I cannot see the counts. Uh, so Ron, can you, uh, how, how are we doing with the responses here? So we have seven, seven responses, one yes and six no. Okay, so uh, maybe let, let's move on. So this is kind of a trick uh, question uh, because the, the answer is we don't really know. And in order to really know that we need to uh, draw, for example, the, the uh, other uh, interval regions. So the, the range we quote as the uncertainty band is usually the 68%. If you look at this, it's usually this range. And we really don't know how, how far this tail extends. And once we plot the 95%, for example, then we, we can then see uh, how compatible this is with zero. So for example, if it's the first case or the second case, then it's at least uh, in, uh, in usual words, the at least two sigma away. But then if, if it's the last one, then it's like two sigma, within two sigma of zero. So if we only have this number, one plus minus 0 0.25, then we cannot really say much unless we make some assumptions about how the, this shape looks like. And the tails can look quite wild depending on what you are measuring. So it's not always a good idea to do a Gaussian ass assumption, even though sometimes that's the only thing we can do. So for example, here is uh, some example of the likelihood function as a function of what we measure. So what's plotted here is uh, the, 
the log of likelihood, and then you flipped it upside down. So essentially, you're looking at the likelihood function. And for example, on the right hand side, you can see as a function of the parameter, uh, this tail looks uh, not really Gaussian like, and there's even a, a huge peak here. Okay. So then um, uh, let me pause it a little bit again uh, to ask for questions. Uh, so is there any questions on the Slack? Yeah, nothing, nothing showing up yet on Slack. It, it's mostly being addressed by our uh, Slack TAs. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, maybe let's let's move on and talk about the correlation, which is quite an important topic. Okay. So in general, the uncertainties from different measurements are correlated. So for example, you can imagine plotting observable one, observable two, and plotting the uncertainty region. And in this case, it might look like this. And then in this case, it will be anti-correlated. And this happens a lot. For example, if you're measuring your, the branching ratio of some particle to two different channels, and suppose the particle can only decay to these two channels, then you will have 100% anti-correlation because if channel one has a higher branching ratio, channel two naturally will have a lower branching ratio. And if you have more decay channels, then it won't be 100% uh, anti-correlated, but you will still expect uh, some, branch of, uh, some correlation between them. And on another word, correlation also matters a lot. So for example, if we have two data points like this, and we have the prediction going touching the top uh, of these two error, uh, uncertainty band, then the agreement depends a lot on the cor uncertainty correlation. So imagine if the uncertainty are fully correlated, so the points move up and down together, then this is a one sigma effect. If they are not correlated, uh, they move up and down independently, then this is a two sigma effect. And if they're anti-correlated, if one goes up, another one goes down, then it's larger, more than two sigma effect. And if the anti-correlation is strong enough, this might even be an observation already. And therefore, uh, to capture the correlation faithfully is really important if we want to compare data and calculation in our equation analysis correctly. And correlation is also everywhere. So just give, to give some examples. So this is the JetRA from Alice uh, collaboration. So you can see that uh, the, these, the green boxes are the data points and the uh, hollow boxes are the uncertainty, the correlated part of uncertainty. And so if you look at the uncertainty between neighbor bins, they are naturally correlated. And the, the reason can be a lot of things, for example, jet energy scale, resolution, uh, there are a lot of reasons why they might be correlated. And uh, even for different analysis, uh, things will be correlated. So as an example, this is the, when we're doing the calibration of jet energy scale in data, in CMS collaboration, so we measure the jet energy response using different events. So we have photon plus jet, so back to back photon and jet, and we use the photon to measure the jet energy. And we also have the Z plus jet here. So these two are completely different analysis. So there are different people doing different analysis using different code on different set of events. One is photon, one is Z. And yet, uh, because electrons and photons uh, Z decays, decays to electrons. Um, so they both use the electric car magnetic colorimeters. And therefore, the uncertainties between 
the measurements of these two channels are correlated. And it is actually quite important to take care of the correlation when we uh, do try to extract the jet uh, energy scale from this channel together. Otherwise, we get a very large uncertainty. Okay, so as a real life example from more from the heavy end land, uh, this is typically what we see from experiments. So we have some global uncertainties factored out. In this case, we have the TAA and the luminosity uncertainty. And we also have some other systematic uncertainties in the boxes. And we also have the statistical uncertainties. And uh, for the TAA uncertainty, for example, if the the input for to calculate this TA number is uh, the same across experiments, then the uncertainty for this part will be correlated even across experiments. So it's not just within experiments that things will be correlated. So it's important to take care of all these uh, correlations as best as we can in our analysis. Okay, so I think this is a good place to uh, uh, take some questions. Um, yeah. Yep. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we're getting questions in the Slack. Uh, um, I don't know if you want to address those uh, or just let the, the replies take care of it. Oh, okay. oh, I guess there's, there's... Okay, maybe I okay. can... Uh, quickly talk about it. So, okay. Uh, one of the questions is what exactly mean is meant by one sigma effect. So it means that uh, if the underlying distribution is Gaussian, then it's one sigma away. Uh, and if it's not Gaussian, then it's some equivalent uh, of that. So uh, in experiments, we usually talk about number of sigmas, but it's it, it comes from the, the Gaussian distribution, basically. OK, and then how is correlation on uncertainty estimated? Uh, this uh, depends, it varies a lot on the sources of uncertainty. Uh, so for example, if you are talking about general energy scale uncertainty, then you can vary the scale up and down and see how there your observable change. And that will tell you the correlation between the points, for example. So there, there are a lot of ways to, to do this, depending on what it is. <coughs> okay, so I don't see additional questions, so let's move on. Okay, so now let's uh, come back to the Bayesian analysis. So how do we exactly model the correlation? So in order to model the correlation, first, uh, we need to choose a compatibility function or the Bayesian likelihood between data and calculation. And the keyword here is choose, because depending on what, what you choose, uh, there are different ways to embed the information in there. So for example, as the most simple one, simplest one, we can choose the multivariate Gaussian uh, distribution to, to model the Bayesian likelihood, which is also used in the previous lectures. So in this case, the log likelihood can be written as like this. So we have the difference between data and calculation a vector times a matrix with the uncertainty information and then uh, multiply by the vector again. And if we choose this Bayesian likelihood, then the, the correlation information will be in, embedded in this matrix. Okay, and in this case, the, the matrix is the covariance matrix. So the definition is up here. I will not talk too much about it because it's kind of a standard in statistics. And this is basically the analog of variance in multi-dimensions. So if you look at the, what's inside the exponent in the Gaussian, uh, in, in, in the Gaussian distribution, 
then this is the multivariate case, and this is the one variable case. And you can see that this covariance matrix is taking the, the role of this variance here. And in this case, the generally, if you see off diagonal entries, then mean, that means things are correlated in general. Okay, and in our Bayesian analysis, there are different sources of uncertainties that we need to take care about. So first we have the interpolation uncertainty, which is coming from the choice of Bayesian analysis details, like how, how many design points. Uh, if we have more design points, then this term would be smaller and so on and so forth. And then we have the correlation matrix, um, the uh, covariance matrix from the experiments. And for this, uh, we will take what we have from the experiments and do our best to reproduce it. Okay, and in general, how we build it is that uh, we add up the covariance matrix source by source. So first we have, for example, the uncorrelated part, uh, which is the statistical uncertainty. And then we have one systematic source, which is somewhat correlated and plus and so on and so forth. We add them all up and we get a full covariance matrix. And uh, as we mentioned before, it's also important to take care of the correlation across different measurements because they exist. And for example, if you have luminosity and uncertainty from the same experiment, but measuring different things, then they will be fully correlated and so on and so forth. So there's also off diagonal blocks across different measurements. And we will see some of this in, in the hands-on session. And uh, one final word is about uh, guesses. So unfortunately, the information from experiments is limited, is quite limited. And in many cases, we are forced to make guesses. So we can go talk to them to get more information, but still in many cases, we have to guess. And then the, this guess uh, then becomes either a caveat in the analysis we perform, like we assume this in the analysis and that this is the result we get, or uh, if we want to systematically explore different valid guesses, different ways to, of guessing this, and then this will result, it, result in additional uncertainty on the extractive parameters. So these are the things that we have to keep in mind when doing analysis. Okay, so now let's uh, ask for some questions again uh, before we go on to the hands-on exercise part. Okay, I don't yeah. see any questions. Yeah, look, looks like we're good to go. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, let me start with some software instructions, then we'll take a couple minutes break. Okay, so uh, those instructions are listed here. So if you haven't done so, please go into the stat directory and pull the latest changes with the git pull. And then uh, in the stat directory, uh, check out the uh, Jetix Gay Summer School 2021 branch. And then for this exercise only, we will need to use the older version of EMCE. Uh, so please also do this uh, before you execute anything. Okay. And then we can start a Jupyter notebook to, to follow the, the hands on session. Okay, so I think this is a good place to pause for a couple of minutes. Okay, and while while we take a few minutes break, I'd like to ask uh, everyone, once you have the Jupyter Notebook up and running, uh, uh, check the, the green checkbox in the reactions. And that will, that will be our normalization uh, for the number of people. And 
And as, as usual, if you're having any issues, you can uh, uh, check the red mark or, or uh, go into the Slack channel and you will, you will get help there. Let me switch the sharing to the Okay, so we have uh, six green check marks, and I think that's our that's our new uh, our new normal. Okay, um, and I also just realized I switched the sharing too early. I still have a couple of slides on the setup. One second. Okay, uh, shall we move ahead? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, so for this part, um, we will do a very simple toy exercise. And the, the main point is about uncertainties. So we do some simple uh, setup to reflect that. So uh, for today, we will try to learn the jet energy loss uh, parameters from digit asymmetry fake data. So the digit asymmetry is, uh, is basically the momentum imbalance between back-to-back -back digits. So formula is defined like this. So it's the difference divided by the sum of the PT of the two jets. And the model setup is like this. So we have uh, measured in two bins. One is the central bins, uh, and another is the peripheral selection. And in both the central and peripheral, this AJ will be smeared by some Gaussian distribution uh, because uh, they are, the two jets are not perfectly back to back and there's some inherent uh, smearing from all the other stuff going around. And in the central collisions, in addition to this smearing, we all just also lose energy. Okay. And the energy loss uh, in this toy sample is basically a Gaussian distribution with uh, size A and the width of A. And the extra smearing is uh, parameterized by this B. So the model parameters in, in this case are just two, A and B. A de determines how much energy is lost. B is the inherent smearing uh, for AJ. Okay, and the goal uh, for today is we try to fit self-normalized AJ distribution to extract A and B. And we will be, you'll be using both central and peripheral data together. And we will run a full analysis uh, with the full settings and we'll go through the steps together. And finally, the important part is we'll play with different uncertainty correlation settings and we can observe the differences. Okay, so now let me switch to the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, uh, so is the font size okay or should I increase it? Yeah, I think, I think it looks okay. Okay. So let me stay like this for now, unless 
people have problems seeing it. Okay, so the notebook we will be looking at is this uncertainty hands-on session. Okay, so first thing to do is let's clear the outputs because there are uh, some outputs from, from, from before that's still left over from here in there. Okay, so um, I think that this notebook should be quite straightforward. And let, let's go through them one by one together. So this is the setup that I just went through. So first we load the relevant Python packages. Not much to say here. We press shift enter to execute the block. Okay. And then we read in the input file. So in this stat package, there is the reader class that does the interface between the, the data files and the code. And you can see that we read the data for central and peripheral events. We read the design points and we read a plot model prediction. That's all pre-generated. So let's just run it. And now comes the important part, which is the setting up the analysis to link different things together. So you can see first, we specify the basic information. What's the system the, the thing is in? Uh, what are the, the parameters that we try to learn? What are the ranges? And what are the observables? So in this case, we have the AJ observable and we have two bins. So C0 is just central and C1 is the peripheral. It's just to, to make it shorter. And then we assign the data points into uh, to, to the appropriate format, uh, so the prediction. So let's not worry too much about the exact form of this. And we can go back and play with this afterwards if, want, if we want to. Okay. Now comes the important part, which is the building the covariance matrix. <clears throat> so the covariance matrix, uh, you can either read in from uh, externally if the experiments provide it. And if not, then you can use this reader class to estimate the covariance matrix for you. So for example, this line builds the covariance matrix between the central measurement of AJ and the central measurement of AJ. So it's the, the diagonal block of the AJ distribution. And this is a peripheral versus peripheral. And then these are the off diagonal blocks. So you can see that it's correlating the central measurement with the peripheral measurement. And for this, uh, I also added some toggles up here. So the correlation length, uh, uh, this, if you want to make it fully uncorrelated, we put minus, minus one. And if we change it to some large number, we can switch it to fully correlated. Okay, so, so to start with, let's put all, both of them minus one, it means that everything is uncorrelated. Okay. And in the end, once we go through the whole thing, we will just change this number and run the whole thing again to, to change the correlation. Okay, let's run it. And it's done, okay. Okay, so before we move on, let's uh, plot some inputs to see more visually what we're looking at. Uh, so first, exclude this plug to plot the input data. Mm. So you can see this is the fake data that we were trying to learn the parameters with. On the left hand side is the Asia distribution for the central uh, collisions and on the right is the peripheral collisions. So what we can see is that in the peripheral there is some AJ distribution that come from online events uh, and other physics. And in central collisions, it's much wider because of the quenching effect. 
Okay, then let's also plot the location of the design points. And this is how it looks like. So there's uh, A and B and the X and Y axis. So you can see that it's kind of scattered everywhere. And uh, one thing you will notice is that some points are quite close to each other. And this is mainly because I generated this with a random number generator and not with the more sophisticated lot of hypercool design that uh, other instructors are talking about. So if you use the light and hypercute design, then you will avoid things like this. The points will not get too close to each other and it's a bit more optimal. But for our purpose, that this doesn't matter and we can move on. Okay, now let's uh, execute the next cell to plot the design, uh, the calculations for the design points on top of the data. So here the red points are data, uh, assume as the same as before, and each blue curve, a uh, blue line is a prediction from one of the design points. And this is one of the plots that you usually see in, in Bayesian analysis papers. This is basically the, before we do any training, how does thing look like? and the, the collection of curves covers the, the data quite nicely. Okay, then let's also visualize the covariance matrix. And you just run this and you can see this is what the covariance matrix look like. So on the top left is the covariance matrix for the central measurement versus the central measurement. So the covariance the diagonal block of the covariance matrix. On the bottom right is the peripheral. And we also have the off diagonal block cor correlating central versus peripheral uh, measurements. So here, because we set uh, the correlation length to minus one, everything is uncorrelated. So you see a nice diagonal matrix here. Okay, uh, so Maybe let's take a quick poll to see if people are, are able to run until this point on their computers. Okay, I see all check marks without X, so we're probably good to go. Yeah, we, we hit our six. Okay, great. Okay, so let's move on. First, uh, there's some bookkeeping to do, just clean the files. That's not too much to say. Okay, now let's run the emulator. Uh, so please exclude this block to run the emulation. Uh, so the number of principal components can be specified here. So we can put smaller or larger number. And the training results is shown here. You can see the kernel. Uh, and what, how much variance does it explain? And uh, to connect to previous lectures, uh, the, the, the metrics you will look for here is the, this number. So for example, if we do eight, that explains 99.5% of variance, which is decent. Uh, for example, if we do three, then it explains only 86.7%, which is not quite enough. We can also do larger and the percent of the variance will be larger. That's explained 99.8%. Okay. And you can play around to, to see how, how many this does. It's basically the same plot that Dan has showed, but we just get the numbers directly without a, a nice plot on it, on top of it, but it's the same information. Okay, so once we're happy with the emulator, let's load it into the notebook for plotting purposes. 
And then let's have some fun with the emulators. So um, we can try to put some numbers here and test our integration to see if this corresponds to what we expect. So for example, if we put a equals zero, b equal to 0.25, then that basically means that uh, there's no quenching effect. And without any quenching effect, the, the smearing will be 0.25. And that's exactly what we see here. So the red points are data and the blue line is what we predict for this parameter set. So in this case, it's a zero, b 0.25. And we can see the central and peripheral predictions are very similar. There's some kink from the fluctuations, but they're very, very similar. Both are from 0.16 or so. Uh, we can also try some other settings, for example, 0.1 and zero. And this is what we see. So in the central, there's the sphering effect, uh, the jet quenching effect uh, from this A parameter. But for peripheral, there is nothing. So it should be a delta function. And this is more or less what we see because it's only predicting on the location of the points. So there's a large number here and then essentially zero afterwards. And just for fun, we can also put in some random number. So for example, the maximum range is 0 0.3. And we can ask what will happen if we put something else that's outside the range and ask the asset to predict. Like for example, 0.1.5. So in this case, what we're trying to ask it to predict something that's not inside the parameter range. And we'll, I think it's quite instructive to see what will happen in this case. And basically it goes crazy. You see even negative values here, large negative values. And this is a common feature for uh, Gaussian process emulators, which is that it does very well for interpolation, but for extra, extrapolation uh, to get numbers that's outside the range, it, generally does not perform that well. And we should avoid it as much as possible. Okay, now that we see that the uh, emulator makes sense, let's move on. So let's run them MCMC sampling. So here I'm using 100 workers, uh, basically 100 different uh, chains of samples. And I use 200 steps as burning and 200 steps as the production. So if you are doing real research, uh, these numbers are way too small. But here is just for the sake of time, I'm using a small number. But if, if you're using doing actual, uh, uh, actual, actual analysis, please use a much larger number than this. Okay, while it's running, let me see if there are any questions. Uh, nope. <clears throat> okay, yeah, you should finish within a minute or so. Yeah, yes. looks okay. It will go until 200, so almost. Okay, it's done. Uh, so let's move on. <coughs> so first we have a block to load the samples into the notebook. So not much to say here, We're just loading things inside. And then we can look at some plots and see if things make sense. Okay, so first plot uh, that we're looking at is the, uh, the how the different walkers go through the parameter space as a function of step size. 
and this is what it look like. So on the top is what we look at for A, and the bottom is for B, and the x-axis is the number of steps in the Monte Carlo uh, MCMC chain. And here we see that it's mostly stable. And, and uh, please refer to the earlier lectures for, for ways to make this more robust. So here we just uh, take a quick look. So to do it properly, you need to test for correlations and, and so on. Okay. And then let's execute the next block to see the correlation of the parameters. So this is the posterior, how the procedure look like. Uh, so you have the A, which is around 0.25, and the B is around 0 0.1. And you also have the correlation between the two. OK. And then uh, let's also look at the next one, which is the posterior plotted on top of the, the input data. Um, okay, so this is how it looks like. So you can see that the posterior distribution follows the data quite nicely, which means that things are, are, are working fine. Okay, so uh, any questions so far on, on this analysis? I don't see anything. Okay, I hope it's easy to follow uh, until this point. Uh, yes, this is since this is the end of the notebook. Do you want to take a, just a quick poll to make sure we still have our six? Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, the next step is go back to the beginning and run things again. So maybe, yeah, it's a good place to, to take a quick poll, I think. Okay, how many are we now? We have we have three, half of our six. There was a momentary four, but then a retraction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I think we'll unless there are if there's so this there's any issues, as usual, the Slack channel or send up a, a red check mark, a red red X. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Yi. Okay, great. So now that we have the analysis running, uh, let's try to change the correlation length and see what will happen. Okay. So for example, if you go back to the beginning and change this to some large number. Okay. And then we go back to the plot again to see what things look like. And this is how things look like right now if we change the correlation length uh, to a very large number. So what's happening here is that uh, almost every bin inside the central uh, measurement is correlated. And also every bin inside the peripheral measurements are correlated, but nothing across the measurements in this case. Okay, and to turn on this off diagonal blocks, uh, we can change the second toggle, which is the off diagonal correlation length. Let's also make it large. And you, then you can see everything lights up. So everything is fully correlated. Uh, we can also change this to some intermediate number, for example, 0 0.1.
and this is how it looks like. So now you see that there is some correlation across the bins, both on diagonal and off diagonal, but not much if the bins are far apart. So you can play with all these to uh, to try to reproduce the the, the to the best of, of your knowledge what the correlation of experiment measurements look like. So uh, for this for this, this exercise, uh, let's put this all to a very large number and see what will happen to the learned uh, parameters. Okay, so before we rerun anything, uh, let's remember the width the parameter looks like this. And let's just re restart and rerun everything from the, from the menu. Now that we have to set up. Okay, so it will run for a few minutes. Um, any questions so far on, on changing the this correlation length? Okay, seems not. Let's see where we are now. Okay, it's running MCMC. Okay, so let's wait a minute to, for this to finish. Okay, so this is the result. And you can see that the parameters are much sharper now that we change the correlation uh, between the data points. So I think the, um, the take home message would be that it's quite important to, uh, to try to incorporate the correlation as to the best of your knowledge from the experiment data points and and that, 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 that can affect your result quite a bit, depending on your, your setup. Okay, so I think that's the end. And there's a small homework, which is, uh, why does it look like this? That it requires some thinking. It's, it's not very straightforward why this gets sharper, but I'll leave that as a homework. For you to think about. Okay, so I think that that's the end of the, the hands on part for me. So I'll hand it back to Ron. Okay, so uh, Yi, does this then conclude the session or is there, are there yeah, any more presentations? That, that's it. Uh, that's okay. it. Okay, so let's take a final round of questions in in the Slack channel or or uh, unmuting either way.
And if not, I think we'll we'll end the summer school for today. So thank thank you to Yi and Dan uh, for setting up the notebooks. I also want to remind everyone to continue to do homeworks and uh, address any questions to the uh, to these two channels, depending on the the notebook. And we'll you know Jetscape will continue to monitor uh, actually for for quite some time. Uh, so, you know, even if it's not this week, if it's next week, we'll, we'll still pay attention. Yep. And then, uh, so finally, uh, tomorrow will be the last day and, uh, we'll look at, at future plans, uh, for Rick, for the EIC, and, uh, also, uh, uh, a discussion of Rivet by, by Christine. And then Abhijit will, will come and close the session at the very end. Abhijit, Christine, and Yi. Okay, so uh, go ahead, Yi. Did you have anything you want? Tomorrow starts at 11 a.m. Ah, so yes. Be careful. Yeah, thanks. So, so a different start time uh, tomorrow. So check check the Indigo uh, for for your for your time zone. Okay, so thanks thanks everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording and then we'll we'll close the Zoom session.